All right, in this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about migrations, at least populating the world. Uh, and we're not going to talk about every migration. Obviously, there are quite a few major ones. Uh, but we're going to talk about some of, the, some of the big ones and some examples of things that happened um, that caused some of these migrations. So first off, of course, Homo sapiens, as I said, uh, moved out of Africa, uh, developed in Africa somewhere around 200,000 years ago. Um, and uh, spread throughout Africa uh, from, from Central East Africa, I thought, um, and moved into various regions. And then ultimately, when conditions allowed and changed and population densities got high, uh, they tended to move um, out of Africa into other regions. Okay? Um, and eventually, they made it through the you know, entire world. But um, and these are sort of paths, and, and there were, it wasn't just one movement, okay? It wasn't just one group of people that moved out and then another group moved out. Uh, there were multiple migrations uh, caused by environmental change, hunting uh, uh, availability, and, and food gathering and things. So there were, there were multiple uh, examples of, of movements out, in and out, and that's why some of these kind of represents why there's uh, slightly different colors. That's why there's one big movement here that moved out to this region and then another one. And then, of course, there were back movements, right? It wasn't just out of Africa. Uh, hominids moved back and forth and back and forth, depending on conditions. Uh, there were routes and all sorts of things uh, that developed. And of course, things that drove it were things like um, uh, uh, ice ages, right? Uh, this line right here is the extent of the, some of the ice age that, that came down into Europe. Um, and other, these are some of the frozen areas with glaciation, driving people in, driving people out. Of course, there were glaciers in Southern Africa as well. Um, some glaciation that occurred uh, here as well as in, in South America over here. Okay. Um, but the, uh, you know, there were movements and those movements uh, responded in various ways. Ultimately, they uh, made movements throughout the Pacific areas and ultimately to, the, uh, to North America. The famous uh, migrations across the, the land bridge uh, formed across the Siberian uh, area and into uh, what's now Alaska, um, and movements from there into to other parts. Okay. Uh, that's one model, and, and certainly I think the time frame. These are these are thousands of years, you know, seventy thousand years ago, forty-five thousand years ago. Uh, pretty good evidence. So again. These, these areas were already populated by a species of hominids, right? We had Neanderthalensis in most of this area, and some in this other area down here. So they were encountering other groups and other, other species or semi species of, of hominids. All right. Now, what we see today is that there is a clear pattern of some of the mitochondrial haplotypes. Uh, much of North America, not all of it, there's some pockets that we'll talk about, but much of North America is, is shared by a fairly common haplotype of mitochondria. These are people that are indigenous, right? They're people that have been here for long periods of time, uh, not recent migrations. Um, and there are a number of subsets of those, as well as this one of this, but, uh, but anyway, the individuals are found, are found there in the forms. Uh, Africa has a, a large subset of uh, various, many different forms here. And that's part of the center of origin discussion, right? We think about uh, from an ecological standpoint, we want to know where uh, a species or a genus, where they're evolved. Um, you go look for the place where there's the most number of species of that genus, because that suggests that that's the center of origin. And the same thing for genetics. You know, we think about alleles in the same way we might think about species, is that there's more allelic variation will be associated with an area where things have been there the longest and where they've moved out to will be areas where you have less variation. And so this, the center of origin for, for hominids is, is clearly Africa and most, most likely into East Africa. Okay, uh, and the further we get away, the less variation that we see. As we see over here where we've had, uh, you know, a few migrational events that have pretty much uh, made all of North America have, uh, indigenously have a, have a common form except for a few spots. Same thing with Australia and other places where you've had uh, only a few invasions that brought the majority of, of hominids there, um, either one or two or three different forms. Okay. Now, once you had humans dispersed, of course, then they, you know, all over, they tended to move with climate. Okay. 
Uh, one of the great migrations and one of the really interesting ones in Africa was known as the, the Bantu migration. Um, and this occurred uh, two to 3,000 years ago. The Bantu tribes uh, were found in Nigeria. They were, they were good, very good at high density farming. Uh, and you know, they were farmer gatherers and they were very good. So they, brought, they actually moved out and there's some discussion that there, you know, whether there was a single wave or multiple waves or a slow process or a fast process, but clearly they did move um, out of primarily being driven by climate change. Okay? Uh, as the climate in this region became drier and drier, you know, the Saharan desert is all up in here and that was wet at one time, uh, their food sources sort of moved and so they moved, but, um, and they moved out into a lot of different regions. And the Bantu became one of the most populated groups that were found uh, throughout Africa. In fact, it's the most commonly spoken language at one time in Africa uh, in the forms. Now there's uh, several groups. These are the Kalari Bushmen, of course, that, that are found um, down in this region. Um, these two groups, um, the, the Himba and, and the Harora, are actually found in um, sort of this region in here, which is, uh, well, about right here, which is, uh, say, in Namibia um, and Angola, uh, the kind of the tribal groups that are found there. And they're actually uh, genetically the same tribe. Uh, they, they, they interbreed, or intermarry, I should say, and they, they are the same tribe. They're, they're really uh, an interesting group if you get to, to, to go and uh, and visit that area of the world, you'll see Himba, particularly northern part uh, of uh, Namibia. And they're the ladies that always, and men that always wear okra, okra. So they put the red dyes over them and, and their hair and their forms. Um, and these, they tend to live out into the, in the bush, okay? Uh, they're often out into some of this area right in here, some of the driest desert in the world, um, and the Namibian desert. And they live in the Namibian desert as well as other places. They're, they're farmers. And they, they persist on, on milk, milk products, milk product. Uh, the Rara, which are the same group, okay, uh, when the Germans came in, and Germany came in and uh, took over this whole region, um, they, uh, they, uh, they, of course, the tribal groups fought them. And one of the things that they did was that uh, the tribal groups, because they were cattle raisers, they raised, they raised cattle. They would, uh, they, one of the, their tactics was, you know, the, the, the Germans would come in, this is classic colonial German approach, they'd come in and line up you know, the weapons in a line and, and, you know, fire and do stuff. So they would have lines of people, uh, of soldiers. And whoever put, so that what they did was they took their, their cattle in front of them and charged into the lines with the cattle first, and then they could attack the lines by, after the stampede. And the Germans, uh, once they separated these groups, uh, took away their cattle, which was their, their livelihood, essentially, uh, and their, their food sources and all, all sorts of things. And uh, they, they forbade them to have uh, cattle with horns. Eventually, they let them have cattle, but they, went, they weren't allowed to have horned cattle, because that's, you know, so they had Polish cattle. And so, the, and sort of the same kind of, you know, um, uh, Okay, if we're not happy with that, and, and kind of sticking their, their nose up to the to the Germans. A lot of women develop these really unique little hats, and they still wear them, and, they're, and they're, you see them often times with these these little hats that represent the horns of, of cows. And so they just kind of say to the Germans, "Yeah, we'll accept some of your colonial dress, and we'll, we'll wear them. We'll not we'll abandon our, our traditional um, you know clothing, but uh, we're going to make these little things. So if you ever get to go there, you see the." Things. Uh, but anyway, there was a lot of, uh, you know, movement in these areas. If you get into things like Swaziland, right on the border there, uh, a lot of this had to do with uh, iron smelting. Uh, these individuals were, were, could build these little uh, one-use smelters. Uh, so they had, they had tools for, for that. And, uh, and they brought that technology along with farming practices uh, into the, all these regions of, of Africa. In Swaziland, there's a, there's a, class, there's a mine, it's just a cave. But there's uh, you go into this tiny little cave, and for about 20,000 years, uh, people have been, humans have been coming there and mining uh, iron ore out of it. And you still go in, and they would use it for different things, obviously for smelting to make to make the materials with it. But they also use it to put on your face. It's a great sunscreen um, that people would wear. Now, one of the interesting things about all this, if we look at my, the migrations that we're talking about, 
these are these are models of effective population sizes. Okay, um, and these effective population sizes mean you know this isn't the full population size. Okay, remember this is effective size population terms. So it's about the amount of genetic material and, and variation there. Well, uh, if we go back about a million years, uh, all human populations, we did signal this over here, we don't know what it was there, uh, dipped, okay? There was a big dip in human populations and effective size that had to do with climate uh, and compression of climate and uh, things. It then built back up over after those periods. Um, and then uh, notice what's going on here. Okay, in fairly recent time, we, these, these green and yellow ones that are down here, and you can follow it, it's pretty much kind of the same with all of these, uh, are Europeans and Asians. And these are the effective size of those, those populations over the last uh, several thousand years, 2,000 years, have decreased, while the African populations, particularly these areas here, have, have maintained. And that's part of that core idea of uh, having a um, and you know the, the central or the site of origin of the system, as well as these populations have just been maintaining themselves. They've been there's been gene flow going around. Uh, of course, in Europe and other areas, you had all sorts of things happen. The plague, multiple plagues. Uh, and there's been climate change. There's been all sorts of things that have come in uh, to to reduce the effective size. So we think about Africa and we think about any of these tribal you know, regions, but genetically, it's a very very diverse. Uh, area for, for you know, human genetic systems. It's really very, very interesting. Okay. Well, what about some of the others? Well, one of the big uh, movements, um, this, this, again, this uh, Minsonian DNA that was part found over here uh, has been moved out. And in fact, um, one of the, the, the most widespread migrations uh, of hominids, of, you know, in recent times at least, um, over the last two, 3,000 years, uh, has been at the spread throughout uh, the Pacific area in Polynesia and, and in the, the other areas. And there's this massive move. In fact, if you, know, if you think about the languages, uh, this is probably one of the most widely spoken in the sense of geographic widely spoken, not necessarily the numbers of speakers. Uh, but uh, this was a huge invasion that occurred across this, carrying this, uh, all these DNA you know, from both, uh, you know, this was Homo sapiens, uh, but they had a, a, a mixture of uh, the Smithsonian DNA as well as, as this um, Neanderthal DNA that have been moved through. And they populated, as you can see, uh, you know, about uh, 3,000 years ago, uh, the islands, uh, which all the islands were populated by individuals who were seagoing uh, individuals. Okay. Um, and you might notice that there's a little arrow here pointing to South America, question mark. Uh, but what we do know about the Americas, obviously, is that uh, most of the um, invasions came, uh, movements of the, the humans came from the land bridge, people moving across once the, the ice sheets had, had, they were following uh, the animals across, following the woolly mammoths and things. In fact, uh, it says here, woolly mammoths were home, you know, woolly mammoths in Florida, you know, 14,000 years ago. Uh, and they clearly came down and there were multiple waves moving through uh, things. Now, you know, that's the way it was taught for most of us for most of our lives as we had this invasion. You know, humans had been here about 10,000 years, maybe 8,000 years, um, and had populated very rapidly down through these regions. But it turns out that they clearly have been there much, much longer than that. Um, there's some evidence that they've been here maybe as old as 20,000 years. Um, and but, but clearly this, this population that came through and these, these multiple trips across here, uh, it wasn't just one, uh, but did spread out and brought all the cultures and you know, the Mayans and the, all the other groups that, that came in. And of course, when uh, by the time that uh, the, the Spanish came in, Europeans came in, uh, the Amazon and these regions down here were heavily populated as well as the, the Caribbean islands, millions and millions of people. Uh, living in these uh, there and living into in South America. So it's a huge cult, you know, large culture supporting a huge population throughout the North America as well as South America. Now, what's interesting about this though, is that if you look, uh, there's, some, there's some timing in here, 15,000 years ago and things, and there's some bubbles that are found down in here. And it turns out that there's, uh, you know, there's always been theories about this, this movement from, uh, 
uh, that came across the Pacific, how many people showed up here. Well, it turns out that there is uh, a population of density down here, particularly some of the Amazon, some of the, some of the indigenous populations that are here uh, of this the sodium, sodium uh, DNA, suggesting that there's pretty clear evidence that this came across. It's not found up in here. It's not found in the Inuit. Uh, it's not found in the people's uh, tribal groups uh, across Canada, uh, but it is found in the localized region here. And as well as, the, of course, Neanderthal and other DNA that's found here as well. And so it's, it's in fairly high frequency in some of these areas. So there's a pretty obvious, obviously, from very recent data, uh, you know, because this group was only discovered in 2010, now we're starting to understand some of this. And I mentioned this because in my own DNA, um, when we went through and, and looked at my DNA, I have a small portion of it that is uh, from a Native American. Um, and most of mine is European, most of mine is, is Scottish and Irish and, you know, typical. Um, but um, I, have, I have some small part that's, uh, that's Native American. And, um, and you know, that, would, that had come down as folklore in my family that we had, you know, which if you're from a Southern family, uh, you probably, everybody has somebody in the past that was you know, supposedly a, um, Cherokee or Choctaw or Creek or something. Uh, and, you know, didn't have a lot of stock in it until I got my DNA results back and I said, sure enough, I had, you know, about 2% or something. I uh, was Native American somewhere. And one of the pinpointed was one of those areas right down here. And, I, you know, it didn't just expand North America, it pulled down into South America. That's really interesting. I'm not aware of any of that. For sure. And um, so I extracted the DNA or the, the uh, yeah, extracted the, the coding and I ran it through another or so other programs you run through, which really pulls apart how much is Neanderthal, which is descent. And I have a fairly high proportion of Dissonian DNA. I mean, it's right you know, here. So, you know, apparently somewhere in my uh, past of individuals that are part of the North American population, uh, they came here. So um, apparently I have some ancestors that came from this part of the world, uh, as well as the ancestors that came from the European part of the world. I thought that was really interesting. So, uh, so there's been multiple ways. Now, now uh, clearly the way that came across, the ways that came across Land Bridge and populate all of North America are the dominant form, but there are other areas and, and there has been multiple invasions of, of um, North and South America, apparently. All right, well, that's pretty much about populating. Uh, we'll now talk about recent ones, and we'll talk about some that are a few hundred years old, all the way up to some that are currently basically going on right now.